Okay, so uh, two lectures ago, I uh, promised uh, I promised you that the top to bottom result, which is a the single statement that the uh, k the fixed field of something and the group uh, of something that fixes a, a base field, that these two operations are inverse for just the top field k and the bottom field f. I said that uh, from this one result, you can in fact deduce the general result that this is uh, inverse for all intermediate fields f, uh, m and h. So let me just restate what the top to bottom result is. Uh, it just says that these are inverse for one particular example, namely for uh, h equal to the whole group g, k, f, and the field m equal to the ground field f. So it says, let the field extension k over f be finite and separable. Uh, then this is normal, namely that it's the splitting field of a polynomial that uh, doesn't have repeated roots. Uh, if and only if the operations are inverse in this sense. Okay, so here this, we, we only say that k and f are inverse. We say, we say nothing about their intermediate uh, fields and intermediate groups. But what I'm saying is the single result easily implies the same result for intermediate fields and uh, m and h. And we will prove that right away. So this is to better illuminate why this is a more fundamental result than this. So I think it's more I think it's worthwhile to prove the corollary first, right? Uh, before seeing why we need to prove this. So this is the proof of the corollary. In fact, why don't we state the corollary first in a more formal way? State. is separable and normal. So that is to say, if it's separable, um, well, I believe I included in uh, this definition uh, separable. I'm going to say it anyway to emphasize. So if k over f is separable, and it is the splitting field of some polynomial in f, then For any uh, subfield M with intermediate field M and any subgroup uh, H with intermediate subgroup between this and the trivial subgroup, uh, we have that these are inverse. Uh, first of all, let's do this one. And then let's do this one. The definition of normal, do you need to allow for like general families of polynomials? No, nope, just one polynomial. The splitting field of one polynomial. Why like how does that reduction makes it like happen? Theorem of the primitive element. Uh, There's one thing that works instead of multiple things. Basically, it we did the work just so that we can avoid talking about families of uh, splitting polynomials. Like if you have a finite family, then you can just take the product, right? But but the theorem of uh, the theorem says if it's a finite uh, extension and it's separable, then it has to be finite. There are only finitely many intermediate fields in between. Okay. Yeah. That is the, right. So the right. theorem of the primitive element says because there are only finitely many, and the fact that we can collapse two, that yeah. means we can collapse any number. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, essentially, the work we've done is so that it simplifies greatly this proof. So 
uh, let us now use the, the top to bottom result to prove the corollary. So let's do one first. Um, this is really where this, this single, this, this part, this, the proof of one, illustrates why that the top to bottom result is way stronger than the corollary. Um, so it's actually pretty obvious why this is true. Um, so, and I have to look at my notes. Since, <laughs> since K is the splitting field, of uh, f, sum f in fx with no repeated roots. But not necessary. Uh, it is also the splitting field So, uh, is this clear? <laughs> this is like, it's so obvious. Hence, by the top to bottom result, by the main result. And then we're done. So, so what just happened? <laughs> It says um, this this condition is sort of uh, intermediate field agnostic. If you have a polynomial in the ground field, then it's also a polynomial over in the intermediate field. And by definition of the splitting field, it has to be the splitting field over any interpretation, right? So. If you interpret f to be an element of mx, then the splitting field is the smallest field under which this splits. So regardless what element you view this as uh, in, the splitting field is the same. And so then you go backwards. This looks like it's, the reason why this is not immediate, right? So that, uh, the reason why it doesn't feel like this is more fundamental than this is that this result, this statement here, is not intermediate field uh, agnostic. If you change f to some intermediate field, this may not be true. But this is. This is intermediate field agnostic. Uh, if you have a polynomial that splits uh, uh, in some splitting field of k and the coefficients come from a ground field f, then it doesn't matter what you view the coefficients to come from. Uh, you can view it to, uh, to have come from any intermediate field n, and it would still remain true. OK, so uh, that's why this is more fundamental, it's, it's this observation. And the proof of 2 takes a little bit more work, but it's equally as important. It says that we can go the other way, and hence it's actually a bijection. Uh, let's see. So uh, before we go on, let me remind you what this notation is. This is the set of all elements, x and k, in the field that is fixed by all h in h. So H is a subset of the automorphism group on K that fixes F. And this is the fixed field uh, of H. The inverse operation, GFM, uh, is the set of automorphisms that uh, fix all elements of M. So, uh, it, does this make sense? Sure. OK, so uh, the proof of this, has really uh, four steps. And we'll 
see what they are. So the first to, is to notice, so uh, first we establish, so step one, uh, there's a degree of freedom observation here. So there's an observation about the sizes of the sets involved. Um, that is the amount of symmetries in a subgroup is at most the uh, amount of symmetries in the amount of symmetries of the group <laughs> in a sense which itself is less than the actual you know vector space dimension K as an extension of KH. So this is actually a very important inequality by itself. Uh, this is trivial. Since this is actually a subgroup. Why? Because this is the set of all elements that are fixed by the things that fix the set of elements that are fixed by H. Did I say two, one too many? I think I said one too many. Okay, this is the set of all automorphisms that fix the set of all elements fixed by the set of all automorphisms in H. And hence, H has got to be one of them. Right? All the elements of H are going to be one of them. Uh, let H in H and want to show is in here, right? So, so indeed, comma. Uh, so in order to show that, we have to show that it fixes everything in this field. Let x be in kh, and must show h of x is equal to x. But x is in kh. <laughs> so, done. <laughs> right, like the. Right, okay. So, uh, but the second inequality is not trivial, and in fact will remain a mystery. So, uh, do you need. Okay, so what is the idea behind this one? number of symmetries can't exceed the number of dimensions you've introduced. Every time you extend a field from a ground field M to a higher field K, you're throwing in more stuff. Uh, in particular, if this is just one thing, if you're throwing in just one thing, you're throwing in the powers of this thing as the new dimensions. So every element in here can be expressed as an m linear combination of the powers of alpha. And you can't, and, the, and an automorphism can only permute the roots of the minimal polynomial of this, right? So if this is a normal extension, if this is actually a splitting field over the minimal polynomial of alpha, then you can only select, then the number of symmetries uh, cannot be too many. Otherwise, the linear algebra will make them fail, <laughs> is, the, is the most vague way I can put this without actually proving the thing, right? So uh, in fact, proving this thing will be too long. So we're going to put it into that box. <laughs> GKF is at most the degree of the extension for finite simple one. Well, uh, even let's let's just do no qualifications so that we can go back and prove this and state it properly. So this is just the first definition. 
make you think that there is only one debt. So, okay, I'll leave you to ponder this, but it is true. So, uh, now, okay, so with the debt assumed, we know this is true. What we want to show is uh, h to be equal to the middle term. So it suffices to show because it's a subgroup. Okay, H is a subgroup of GKKH. So if these are the same, then these are the same. And because the number of elements is uh, indicative of your equality in the finite setting, we're done. Okay, so what does this mean? Oh, yeah, good. So, uh, in fact, uh, we know that less than or equal to, so we may as well just assume this. So we may as well just show the greater than or equal to. Okay, so we have less than or equal to here, so we just need greater than or equal to there. So step two is showing this, and it comes from, uh, so, so we're going to approach this by the theorem of uh, primitive element. K is separable. Since K over F is separable, so is K over any intermediate field, including FH, uh, KH. Why? Uh, why? a little bit weird, so we'll come back to this. This is actually easy, but we're still going to leave it as depth. one thing to get to K. Okay. It suffices to show that the degree the min poly of alpha over f, uh, kh, right? Mm, yes. Is at most. This. Because we want to prove this, so we better show that the min polynomial of alpha is at most this. Okay, so this is equal here. That quantity is equal to this degree. Uh, let's call it, what did I call it? Let's call it, did I even name it? I didn't name it. Let's call it f of x. This quantity is equal to the degree of the minimum polynomial of KH, as we proved in my long, long uh, talk when we proved it. And so it suffices to show that this degree is at most uh, H. So why might this be true? <laughs> so obviously, the naive thing to do is be like, oh, uh, done, x minus alpha. Look, this is the minimum polynomial. Well, that's not going to work because it's not in k. In general, that's not going to be in khx, is it? This coefficient might not even be in kh. In fact, right? In fact, if this is in kh, then k equals kh, and there's nothing to prove. So this 
So this is, <laughs> this is the most naive way to do it, and it won't work, because it's not a minimal polynomial over kh. So we've got to throw in more stuff, right? Until the coefficients, when expanded, lands in kh. When does that happen? When you have a full set of roots that exhibit all possible symmetries of this extension field, right? Then it will come out, and the, the then it will come out to be like actually in the ground field, the coefficients. So we have the list of symmetries in our hands, H. So let's list them. This is the identity applied to alpha. This is some other, let's call this sigma 2, some other uh, automorphism from H applied to alpha. I'm going to take the product of all of these and claim that this is the minimal polynomial of alpha. So that's what we're going to do. Let, let P of x be the product over all sigma in H of uh, x minus sigma of alpha. One of them is the identity, so alpha is one of them. Alpha is the root of uh, one of the monomials. So uh, why is this going to be the minimal polynomial? Well, we better check. So we better check. So uh, it doesn't matter whether this is the minimal polynomial, right? If, if it's not minimal, then the degree of the minimal is even smaller. So it suffices to show. So we better check that. So it suffices to check. Uh, uh, that p of alpha that p, p of x, rather, is in h of x. Why? Because the degree of this is precisely the number of elements of h, which is little h. And, if this, and this clearly annihilates alpha, because the identity is one of the uh, permutations. So alpha is the root of this polynomial. And any polynomial of degree d that annihilates alpha <coughs> will show that the minimal polynomial of alpha is less than or equal to d in degree, uh, uh, little h in degree. So we're done if we can show that this polynomial is in KHX. Symmetric polynomials, right? That's right. So this is the first time we'll encounter them. When we expand this polynomial, what happens? The coefficients come out to be the symmetric polynomials on the, the, the different roots. So let me, let me do an example. What is the constant term? It's going to be uh, ABC up to negative 1, which I'm not going to write down. What is the middle two terms? So what's the term in front of x squared? Well, it's going to be the, the, possi uh, it's going to be the sum of all the possible two products. right? So AB, AC, BC. Up to negative 1. And uh, what is the one on the uh, linear term? It's going to be the set of all possible, it's the sum of the all possible one products. So a plus b plus c. I think, uh, the, uh, the other way around, yeah. You said that oh, the middle. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Uh, sorry, yes, it's the inverse. So uh, constant linear uh, oh wait, constant linear hmm. quadratic and uh, leading, leading uh, coefficient. Um, these are the symmetric polynomials, the elementary symmetric polynomials in three variables. It turns out that every symmetric polynomial is a, a combination of these, a polynomial combination of these, with coefficients coming from the ground field. That's much less trivial. However, uh, bear in mind that these are symmetric. No permutation will change these. No, these are all invariant under any permutation of the three variables. Okay? So when this gets multiplied out, it's just going to be, the first term is going to be 1. The next term is going to be the sum of all the linear terms. And then sum of all the two products, and so on, up to negative 1. And no permutation is going to change these. It's these polynomials evaluated at the different roots that are all distinct. And no permutation will change that. So, 
So uh, coefficients of p are uh, uh, Sj applied to sigma 1 alpha, sigma 2 alpha, and so on, sigma h alpha, where Sj is the j symmetric polynomial. are invariant. They meaning the coefficients. They are H invariant. So all coefficients That is to say, sigma of Sj of sigma 1 is still equal to Sj uh, because which is still equal to left multiplication by a permutation in a group just permutes them. And th this is invariant under permutation, and therefore it's equal. <laughs> right? These are all symmetric polynomials, the ones that just you base. No matter how you permute the variables, you're going to be the, it's, it's the same expression. OK, so now we're done. So that's really the step three, <laughs> is the bringing the observation that these are symmetric polynomials. Um, okay, so then the last step is to note that, uh, well, okay, I guess I don't have to say the last step. Yeah, okay, so that's it. Any questions about this? So, uh, so the top to bottom result really does imply uh, item one, which was uh, it's inverse in the other way, and item two, which is it's inverse in this way that it's equal uh, in this way. And uh, so we basically just proved the top to middle results in the fundamental theorem, that the, the two results are, can I write here? Good. So uh, the top. Uh, write larger, though. Sure. So, the, so, the, so before I erase the statement of the corollary, it was uh, uh, k to the gkf. So that was implied immediately, actually, by the, by the top to bottom result. And this has uh, really nothing to do with the top, top to bottom result. It has something to do with the symmetric polynomials and this argumentation. So uh, H to GK H. So yeah, so this is what I call the top to middle results. And they follow, number one follows from the top to bottom results, which is why it's important. OK, so let's prove the top to bottom results for the uh, other half of this lecture. So yeah, so this is a significant progress towards proving the fundamental theorem. Uh, that's why we want this. So statement again. Uh, good. OK, I'm going to just uh, switch. Sure. Call this property normal. 
Did we start again? Yeah. Oh, so yeah, we, we call this property normal. Authors sometimes, uh, I believe my definition of normal also included separable. So, uh, so that property is normal because we're assuming that it's not inseparable. Okay, so the, both directions are very, very interesting. Uh, let's go with the, this direction first because we get to revisit the symmetric polynomial argument again. So by the way, the symmetric polynomial argument is so fundamental, right? So uh, this argumentation is like at the heart of uh, Galois theory. So uh, we're gonna use it again now. And uh, if this is true, then Okay, so I guess, I guess I wrote down some intuition I should explain to you. Then it contains all the symmetries you can have. It should have. All symmetries it should have. Uh, by it, I mean k over f contains all the symmetries it should have. Uh, so if, if, you want to sh if we want to conjure up a polynomial such that it splits over k, what should that, what should that polynomial be? Like, what, can we po what do we have that's, that we can possibly work with? Well, the elements of GKF. And what are the roots of that polynomial? What are the possible roots that we can possibly come up with, right? What do we have to work with? Well, by the theorem of, by the, theorem of the primitive element, there's one thing that we can throw into f to make it k. So maybe that polynomial should contain that element as a root. And as we have done before, let's make sure that the roots exhibit all the possible symmetries that could, it could possibly have, which it does have. So it's going to equal, in a sense. Okay. So, uh, so that that is the intuition that uh, why this works. Uh, so our goal is to make a polynomial that splits over k, and ensure that the uh, coefficients are in f, and that it is actually uh, minimally splitting. So, so construct p as follows. Uh, since this is separable, finite separable, uh, k equals f at joint alpha for some alpha in a by the theorem of primitive roots. Theorem of the primitive root. So let the other board let p of x be this thing, except gkh. So I'm going to write it again. So let's not cheat by using the same board. symmetries in inherent in the extension uh, permuting this single element. It suffices to check that is this. So it suffices to check that it's in here. Okay, 
so the copying of the board continues. <laughs> so wh why, why does it suffice to check this? First of all, uh, so having checked this, all the coefficients are in fact in f. So we're sure that p of x is a polynomial in fx. Agreed? Now that it's a polynomial in fx, we better make sure that k is the splitting field of this polynomial. But note that one of these roots is alpha, because sigma being the identity shows that alpha is a root. Right. But that means no smaller field can possibly make it split by definition of f adjoint alpha. K is the smallest subfield. Uh, sorry, uh, K is the small. F. Okay, K is the smallest field containing both F and alpha. Hence, it must contain. Hence, any splitting field must. Well, any splitting field must contain F and alpha, and K is the smallest such field. Therefore, K is the splitting field by definition. Okay. Yes. Agreed. That is why it suffices to check. Okay. So let's check. Uh, coefficients of p are, again, the symmetric polynomials evaluated at the roots. Uh, by convention, sigma 1 is always the identity when we list things. permutations in GKF. And multiplication on the left by any of its own permutations will just serve to permute the elements. But the symmetric polynomials are invariant under such permutations. Hence, they are GKF invariant. So, so all the coefficients lie in K GKF as required. Now, uh, let us see how similar this board is to this board. They are actually exactly the same, right? So uh, it's the same proof. I think you can actually interpret P as a, a characteristic polynomial of like a linear map, right? Because the constant term would be like the field norm of alpha, right? What's the field norm of When you alpha? multiply all the Galois conjugates together? Yes. yes. And then you can also get the field trace. On the linear term? Yeah. So it's just like a characteristic polynomial. You have or like the, the second last term. Yeah. Yes, OK. Yeah. So this, uh, oh, OK, sure. Yes. What's the conjugate? So if you have an irreducible polynomial, all of its roots are said to be conjugate to each other. OK. Uh, Okay, yeah, sure. Uh, we don't know whether p is irreducible in f or not, but it doesn't matter. It's the splitting field. Yeah. Okay, so that was uh, this direction. And again, it uses the symmetric polynomial argument that we have come to love. In fact, this is the reason why we do Galois theory, right? Because the symmetries. The symmetries characterize the field. So because this is equal to f, you're in f if you're symmetric with respect to all the permutations. You've just characterized element hood of f being in f, what that means. If you're an element of k and you want to test whether you're in f, let's try to permute me with all my symmetries. If I don't change, I'm in f. Because if I'm not in f, I'm going to change at some point. Some permutation is going to find me and change me. Because I'm not in the ground field. Because I contain all the symmetries that I should have. That's what it's saying. Okay? So that's why this argument works, is because of that. OK, so the other direction is equally as interesting. If I am the splitting field of, a poly of a some polynomial over f, why, am I, why, why do I satisfy the top to bottom uh, inverse relationship? Uh, here we're going to use induction. 
So the base case, so let, let me write down the inductive, uh, inductive uh, statement. P of n is the statement that it's going to induct on, induce on, the degree of the extension k over f. So n is the degree of that extension. So let k over f be finite separable. Then if k is the splitting field of some That's the statement. So let's prove the statement. Base case is uh, when the degree is 1. So the top field is equal to the bottom field, and there's nothing to prove. So that's the base case. Degree 1 extension is the same as saying you're equal, because uh, the basis element is just 1. So let's proceed by strong induction. Assume n greater than 2 and uh, p of k is true for all k less than n. OK, here's the reason why this case is true. Uh, let me get to that point first, and then I'll explain to you the definition, uh, the intuition. Sorry. Because if, if, okay, your, your, your polynomial f uh, cannot already split in f, because that's this case, and we assume n is greater than 2. So there has to be something that, so it has to not have some root. And that root belongs to an irreducible factor of f. Okay, that's not linear. So that's all I'm saying. You seem to have a question. Is n greater than or equal to 3? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Oops. Good. Uh, so, uh, OK, so call it p. Uh, but note that, again, uh, k is still the splitting field. Join alpha one. Oh, what is alpha one? The roots of p. So list list the roots of p. By the way, because it's separable and it's irreducible, then the roots are distinct, right? So that's where uh, we're using separable again. Alpha one to alpha r are the roots of p. K is still the splitting field of f over f alpha one. Because you still you need you still need to include alpha two, alpha three, up to alpha r, and the and the other factors of f, right? Because p is only one irreducible factor of it. So you better also yeah. So the the smallest field containing both f alpha one and all the other roots is still k. So uh, okay. So uh, now. K over f alpha 1 is strictly smaller than k over f. Why is that?
because alpha 1 is a root of an irreducible polynomial of, that's not linear. Okay, so uh, by power theorem, that degree is at least 2. Not 1, because alpha 1 is not already in F. And so this degree times this degree is equal to this degree. So this is strictly less. This is strictly more than this. Okay, so uh, does that make sense? Okay. So by the inductive assumption, this satisfies the, uh, so again, because of debt number two, <laughs> it's still separable. This is still separable and finite. Hence, it satisfied the inductive hypothesis for uh, k less than n. So by induction, From this, we try to deduce this is saying, okay, well, let's proceed by induction uh, root by root is what this is actually happening, right? If you unwind the recursion, then it's going uh, to, you're just basically doing it step by step. Having shown that it's a uh, uh, invertible up to this point, let's go one more step and go do that step and, and get the inversion for the, for the current view. So how, how does this work? So this is the, this is the final statement we want to prove. So from, from this, we better be able to deduce this. And somehow this will help. So what's the punchline here? What allows this to be true? So the, the intuition is actually something weird. Uh, have you ever noticed that if you had a minimal polynomial of degree r, then the basis of uh, then the basis of k uh, of f alpha over alpha over f uh, take this extension. Uh, if the minimal polynomial of alpha has degree r, then the basis is one alpha alpha squared all the way up to not alpha to the r but alpha to the r minus one. Okay, so this says that uh, if you had a constant, if you had a constant in your ground field f, so maybe this is the sum of a, so maybe a lambda one, so one alpha to the one plus lambda r minus one to the alpha r minus one. If this is equal to some constant this lambda that's in the ground field, now we're in trouble, right? Uh, in the sense that if you subtract both sides, this is going to happen. But the degree of this is r minus 1. So if we can find r distinct roots of this polynomial, we'll be done. There, there will be a contradiction. That's the intuition. If, if an element does not pass the, uh, hey, apply your symmetries to me. If I don't move, then I'm in the ground field test. Then uh, something wrong is going to happen in this manner. Okay. So we're claiming that in order to test whether we're in F, we just have to ask our symmetries. Right. That's what we're claiming. If this didn't work. Right? If this didn't work, then you're going to end up with a situation where your degree is too small to have this many roots. So uh, let me try to stop being vague and just tell you the argument. So well, this is true. Why? Clear, clear. Is it clear? It's clear. Uh, <laughs> it's harder to fix things here. Okay. 
and therefore it, it inversed when this happens. Because this is a smaller group, it's easier to be fixed by the larger thing, uh, the smaller thing. There are fewer things to check, in a sense, right? There are fewer things to check, so this is going to be bigger. But that, by the inductive hypothesis, is this. Okay, so that's where we use the inductive hypothesis. So we have used this fact. So, uh, but, we, but we want z in the left hand side to be in f, not just this. However, we know how to express z. Now that we know that it's in this form, that's very helpful because now we know how to express z. A general z has a unique representation in this form. Here I'm defining, so this by, the, by, by construction, p is the minimal polynomial of alpha 1, because p is irreducible and has alpha 1 as a root. So the degree r is the degree of this extension. <coughs> so we know that this has dimension r, and this is the basis <coughs> element. These are the basis elements, the powers of uh, alpha up to r, r minus 1. Fortunately for us, we know that it doesn't change, right? So here, here, z passes the symmetry test. I've, I've applied all of my symmetries to me, and I found that I didn't change. So now I'm trying to show that it's in f. Well, I passed the symmetry test. Uh, how can I possibly not be in f, right? Because if I permute myself via some other uh, permutation, uh, sigma z, why did I circle that? So this is alpha 1. Uh, if I can permute, uh, if I can select a permutation sigma such that it sends alpha 1 to any of the other alpha j's, the other roots of p, then what I would have is that I would have this. Where sigma j is in gkf is suitably chosen to send alpha 1 to alpha j. Okay? So, now, uh, I pass the symmetry test. That's the assumption. Z in here, right? I passed all the symmetry tests. So I'm fixed by all my symmetries. And yet, I satisfy the same polynomial for r different things, right? So now, uh, lambda naught minus z plus uh, lambda 1 L, uh, x plus lambda r minus 1 x to the r minus 1 as an element of the big field, the top field, as a top field polynomial has r distinct points. If z is not in k. If z is not in f, we're assuming these coefficients are all 0. Uh, if z is in f, okay, z is in f if and only if all the higher coefficients are 0. Right? Because there's a unique way to express z as a linear combination of the basis elements. And you're not, and you're in z if you're in f if and only if this is the only term you have. So if, if z is not in f, that means one of these co higher coefficients is non zero. And so this polynomial is non zero. And yet it has degree r, uh, r minus 1. And it has r, at most, degree at most r minus 1. And has r distinct roots. So that's a contradiction. Hence, uh, so do you see the argument? Does everyone see the argument here? 
I'm able to permute myself around and show that the alpha j's satisfy a degree p minus uh, a degree r minus one or fewer polynomial. That's a contradiction. A polynomial um, of degree r minus one can only have r minus one. It's not r, <laughs> right? And here, here's where we use the separability before, as before. So there's one little problem, though. Can anybody spot the problem here? How do we know that this is? How do we know that this can be done? Here's a question to uh, ask: If I have an irreducible polynomial p, is there a symmetry that sends any of its roots to any other root? Debt. <laughs> So, is GKF transitive, right? When That's definitely not true for all K. When the poly is irreducible. Do you know what polynomial I'm talking about? The polynomial that K is the splitting field of. So when, it turns out that this is transitive, when poly is irreducible. So, uh, these are the details that we need to prove that, uh, that, that you can send any root to any other root, provided that the polynomial is irreducible. So, that, uh, what I'm, so what this says is that all the roots of an irreducible polynomial, namely conjugate roots, are indistinguishable in this way. That there is a, there's a symmetry sending any root to any other root. And of course, it might mess up the other uh, roots, but we don't care about that. So, uh, in fact, the group, uh, the Galois group, is transitive if and only if the polynomial is irreducible. Because if there are irreducible factors, then those roots can't be guaranteed to be able to interact. That there is a that you can differentiate between them in the field uh, in the field way. Okay, so uh, so now we're done. So therefore, hence dead must be in F. And we just showed that an arbitrary element in K, GKF, is in F. And so we're, we've shown that this is done. Right? So we've shown that uh, any element up here uh, is, is certainly in uh, F alpha. And we just showed that it's in F. So any questions? Now that we're done. So that is that is the inverse direction of uh, the top to bottom result. So yeah, both directions are equally uh, interesting. This direction is interesting because it's actually an easy direction. This is actually the easy direction, if you, if you think about it a little bit. Right? The other direction uses the symmetric polynomials, and that's where the heart of the argument lies. That if you set... If you are a field that has the uh, sym symmetry test property, then you are a splitting field of some polynomial. Okay, so that'd be the end of this lecture, then, if there's no questions.